right, uh, in no particular order, first, my good friend Robin Waters from Tech.eu. Robin, please come on stage. Big round of applause, please. And Kassar, so it's a small, you know, a small accelerator lost somewhere in you know, the west coast of the US. I've never heard of it. So I'm really eager to, to know more about what, what you guys do there. Because I'm not sure exactly what I'm not even sure. You know, Tech.eu, that's a really big brand name, but why see? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. On that, guys, the stage is yours. Have fun. Thank you. Not the first time I've been introduced by Paul, first time I've been introduced by Carl. Um, so my name is Robin Waters. I'm the founding editor of Tech.eu. Um, I used to work at TechCrunch and the Next Web, covering innovation all over the world. And then I got sick and tired of covering Silicon Valley all the time because I thought, you know, innovation and startups come from anywhere. Uh, Europe is a pretty interesting place, uh, so I'm going to write about Europe only. And I forgot about Silicon Valley. So obviously now we're going to talk about Silicon Valley. Um, and I'm very pleased to, to welcome Kassar here. Um, today uh, in Bulgaria, in Europe actually, uh, because Y Combinator isn't typically in Europe all the time. So. Uh, but first of all, what's Y Combinator? Uh, so YC is a um, early stage fund. Uh, I think uh, if you've heard of any accelerators or incubators in the world, they tend to model themselves after, to some degree, uh, YC. We were founded in 2005 by a guy named Paul Graham, who's a uh, kind of prolific technologist himself. Uh, and we, uh, we're a little different. We invest a small amount of money in a large number of companies. Uh, our last batch, we funded 132 companies. Um, that sometimes implies low quality because we were like, oh, 132 companies. They must be letting anybody in. Uh, it's not, that's not exactly the case. Uh, a typical batch, we have six to 7,000 companies apply for funding. So a couple of percent uh, accept rates. Um, and then beyond that, what YC provides is advice and, um, and, and mentorship. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we're just investors. So you said a couple of things there. You're an early stage fund, you're an investor, you're a startup accelerator, and you're all of that in one, uh, really. Uh, but what do, you, what do you not want people to call you? Because you know, we talked about this earlier, but accelerators kind of Becoming a bad word in a sense. Yeah, the, uh, the, the term accelerator, I think it traces back to a Kauffman Foundation paper in 2007 or so, where they were trying to describe Y Combinator and Y Combinator like funds. And they create, you know, they said, okay, well, the, this is accelerators. There were accelerators in the last uh, era of, you know, startups in the late 90s, uh, but they're all kind of slightly different. Um, the reason I think we generally don't call ourselves an accelerator or an incubator or whatever is there's so many uh, of these, there's, there's like 2,500 in the world, and most of them exhibit pretty poor behaviors, and uh, we just don't like to, you know, we, and then we get kind of lobbed in with that group. So uh, I don't know, whatever you call us, we, we like to find good founders uh, and invest in them, and, and we've done a pretty decent job. We have about, our portfolio numbers at, at a high level, we've invested in about 1,000 companies, where we're seed investors in, and those companies are now worth, in aggregate, $65 billion. Um, 10 of them are worth over a billion, 40 of them are worth over 100 million. So, uh, not bad. It's a pretty good track record. <laughs> um, but then if you look at the accelerator space in general, um, you really only have three, arguably, you only have three global brands in the startup acceleration. It's the Techstars and 500 Startups and the other ones. Um, Techstars and 500 Startups, have a different strategy because they go to different places in the world to set up sort of like a franchise model and set up different accelerators, partner with corporate sometimes. Um, my Combinator is decidedly only in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we definitely are purists uh, in, a very, uh, in a very true sense. We have one office in Mountain View. We only invest out of Mountain View. Uh, well, we funded Bulgarian companies, we funded lots of international companies, but we expect them to move to Silicon Valley. Uh, I think a controversial viewpoint we have is, um, especially when I'm speaking at international conferences, is uh, we think the best place in the world to build a company is Silicon Valley. A software company, uh, or a tech company, because we do invest in a lot of hardware now, uh, is Silicon Valley for many, many reasons. But probably three primary reasons. One is the volume of engineers. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer, there's a lot of engineers in the valley. Uh, probably uh, the highest concentration of software engineers, especially at a high quality than anywhere in the world. I mean, there's probably one building in Google has more engineers than, you know, New York City. 
Uh, the second is a sophisticated investor class. Um, there are thousands of investors, there's thousands of funds. Uh, most of the venture dollars in America and in the world uh, are invested within a 15, 20 minute drive. It's an incredible concentration of investing capital, which is good if you're a founder. If you're a founder and you're in an ecosystem and there's five investors, they really command and control your destiny. But if there's many investors, um, they're forced to move faster because of competition in, in the ecosystem. And uh, there can only be many investors if there's many startups. Uh, it's just, uh, I mean, people talk a lot about Silicon Valley today, but Silicon Valley is, you know, is not a new phenomenon. It's been around for 70 plus years. Um, and then the third thing that exists in Silicon Valley, which doesn't exist really anywhere in the world, at least to that level, is acquirers and providing liquidity. Uh, companies like Google and Facebook buy companies at a rate which is uh, just not common outside Silicon Valley. And that liquidity provides returns for, uh, for the engineers and for those investors. You know, I, I've, I've been in all three of those. I was an engineer, founded a company, I'm an investor through Y Combinator, my company was acquired by Google. And all of that within like a seven minute driving distance. Uh, it's a very concentrated ecosystem. So, you know, for that reason, we believe it's best for companies to come and at least be exposed to that culture. You know, we funded Bellaby, which is a, a company here in Croatia. Uh, they have an office now in San Francisco, an office here. So we definitely believe in it. Uh, there's a bunch of international YC companies, but uh, there's something special about Silicon Valley, and we're kind of purists in that sense. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more, because you mentioned it's all the things you say are true. Uh, I'm not so sure it's going to stay that way. Um, you mentioned it's a very concentrated ecosystem. It has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. So you kind of live in a, I don't want to use the word bubble, but I'm going to do it anyway, uh, because we're not talking about investment terms. But you live kind of inside of a bubble. You don't really know what's going on in the world if you're constantly surrounded by, by people who are also in this. I, I think it's not that you don't know what's going on in the world. You are more susceptible, uh, especially if, you, if your logic is not very strong to be influenced by bad ideas. Uh, I think you know the, one of the best kind of things I heard uh, when I was a founder was, it's good to come up with an idea outside of the valley and then build a company in the valley because I think that gives you like the most amount of clarity. Um, yeah, there's definitely problems with Silicon Valley, but they far outweigh the the you know the the, the pros far outweigh the cons. And I'm not saying that's the only path. I'm just saying that's the path we found is successful. But I see uh, quite a lot of European startups move to the valley to open up an office to hire engineers, it was usually after they raised even two or three rounds of funding because the, the engineers are obviously much more expensive than they are, uh, let's say in Bulgaria or, or other places in Europe. Um, so how do, you, how do you think that trend will continue? Because the prices seem to be only going up, both for rent, for office space, for living, um, for hiring. Yeah, I mean, if I, could, if I could invest, if I could put millions of dollars into the concept of Silicon Valley, I would do it. I would put everything I had into, I, I believe in the so you think it's super sustainable. It's incredibly sustainable. I, that's like saying, you know, I think the only real fundamental change in technology uh, in the next 20 to 30 years is China. China is a powerful ecosystem. It's a, it's a, a billion consumers. And I think China is going to change the world, uh, whether we, you know, I think as uh, Napoleon wrote in 1806, when China awakes the world will shudder. I think it's absolutely true. Uh, people, I think, underestimate China even, even today. Uh, so I think that, that's going to impact Silicon Valley, whether, whether we like it or not. If you look at those logos, you know, one of them was Chinese. Um, and I think that that's just the beginning. I think in 10 years, 20 years, maybe all of them will be Chinese. Uh, but beyond that, I don't see a real fundamental shift. Um, now, it's silly to think that all the founders and all the technology companies in the world will be based in Silicon Valley. That's never been true and it never will be true. There'll always be big companies in Europe, there'll always be big companies in Asia, um, but uh, I think a disproportionate number. It's kind of like if you want to be in acting. You can be in acting, you can be in acting in Bulgaria, you can be in acting in London, you can be in acting in Paris, in New York City as a huge Broadway scene, uh, and you can live as an actor there. Um, but if you want to be Tom Cruise, you have to kind of move to LA, whether you like LA or not. And that's, and why? There's many things. It's a good metaphor. Yeah. But yet, you're here. Um, you're in Bulgaria. The trying to find actors. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first and the last time we met was in Istanbul, of all places yeah, as well. Yeah. So 
What brings it to Europe? Is it, is it, are you basically here to recruit companies to come over to Silicon Valley and apply to the program? Uh, I mean, three, three things. Um, one is, I think, uh, YC, because we have this just Mountain View, Silicon Valley perspective, I think it's a good way for us to, to, to meet people here uh, and kind of send our ideas and our way of the world uh, to, to other ecosystems. Um, so one is literally just getting YC's brand out or name out. Number two is for me to understand what's happening in the edges of the, you know, of, of the universe, um, because it does impact Silicon Valley in a very fundamental way. Um, there's no reason not to believe that the next huge company will be from European founders or Bulgarian founders. There's no, there's no reason uh, for us to believe. You know, I think Bella Beat Croatian company has a very good chance of being a multi-billion dollar company, um, and we wouldn't have found that if we didn't do things like this. That was from another conference. Um, and then the third is I just like to travel, so this is an <laughs> opportunity for me to travel. Um, so what do you look for in companies? Um, it's obviously, you mentioned that you have a pretty low acceptance rate, uh, as most of the top accelerators do. Lots of applications, only a few get in. What makes the difference? Uh, I mean, other than generic answers like good team um, and good idea, I'll, 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 let, me, let me change the question. What is the common theme between companies who fail? Uh, the common theme- Fail to get in? Or fail to get in or fail in general, I would say, because we're really trying to find good businesses. Uh, number one is, uh, you know, I just watched uh, Warren Buffett's uh, annual shareholders meeting at Berkshire, and he was saying that we don't we don't buy stock, we buy businesses. And I think Y Combinator thinks the same way. I'm not investing in a round. I'm trying to buy a business. And within that context, when I'm talking to a owner of a business, this this whole startup, you know, kind of trend and ecosystem is a little disconcerting because people get away from this core fact that we really are just building businesses businesses that I hopefully generate lots of revenue. So when I look at a business, and I look at the owners of the business, I think um, uh, these are the weaknesses. Let's say you had, you had Techie, let's say it applies to YC. And the first thing that I would say is, oh, you know, media, can, can media companies become large standalone public companies? Now, most founders, when you approach their company with an obvious hole or obvious negative thing, tend to explain a, it away without actually addressing the problem. Um, and so they're almost like ignorant to the biggest weakness their company has. And there's, there's weaknesses in Y Combinator. I, I know what those weaknesses are. Uh, and it's important for you as the owner of the company to know what those weaknesses are and then address it, especially when you're raising seed financing. Like the way to think about a company is kind of like pulling a bow. And when you're very early in its company's life, especially when we're investing, you can change the trajectory by moving your hand. But as soon as you let that bow go, it's very difficult to change that company and what that company becomes. And so when the bow is being drawn and we're trying to invest the first check into the company, we say, well, why would you do, you know, just read a database in this way rather than another way? Why would you do a car sharing company? There's already Uber and Lyft and all these. So we ask these questions and a lot of times founders have these like semi-delusional answers. And the problem is you have to be delusional to be a founder. So it's a real kind of, you know, difficult, uh, position to be in as a founder. You have to uh, be critical of your company, but also believe that the company can be huge even within its outstanding weaknesses. Are there any verticals that you like in particular? We don't, we don't believe, <laughs> well, so we don't, you know, a lot of investors have this view that, oh, there's these trends like uh, VR, or IOT, or blockchain, or whatever it is. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, I don't believe I'm smart enough to um, understand what the market has. So when I invest, I look at the founder in front of me, and I look at their idea, and I look at where the, what they've accomplished, I look at their raw skills, and I make a general assumption, is this a good business that I want to buy? And it's not that, well, I'm really into IoT, and I'm really into blockchain, and you're a blockchain business, let's invest. I think that's a, personally, everybody has a different uh, investing style. I mean, I mean, you can take uh, funds like Sequoia, they have thematic investing or Andreessen. You know, I think 20% uh, of the NASDAQ is Sequoia companies. So it's hard to say that they're bad investors. So other investors approach investing tech in different ways. I and we, uh, the partnership, uh, we very much look at just the founder in front of us. If I find a good IoT or blockchain company or a good Bulgarian founder, I don't give a shit about anything else. I really don't. I have a, I have a very pragmatic view on investing. And that's why I'll, I'll, I'll invest in, you know, like uh, the joke I make is, if you could have an arm growing out of your forehead, but if it's a good business, I'll buy. <laughs> you know, I don't care if you speak good English. I don't care if you're 
you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. If it's a business, it's a business. And therefore, to extend that, I don't, I don't believe I know the themes that the market will actually, you know. Uh, to, so you, you mentioned other investors. How do you, what's your relationship with the, these other like, big VC firms in the Valley? I know some of them co-invest with YTC all the time. Um, some of them stopped going to Demo Day altogether, and then there's everything in between. I don't know there's any that, that, the ones that stop going to Demo Day are probably the worst investors in the Valley because they're like literally working against their own interest. Um, if anything, we had investors, uh, powerful investors, who for many years were cynical about this thing called the Y Combinator and this, you know, kind of a joke that was in Mount. I mean, when I, when I, I'm an alumni of Y Combinator. When I was looking to raise money, people would say, why are you raising money from these guys? It sounds stupid to give up so much of your company for so little money. I think everybody now doesn't debate that anymore. Um, in terms of what our relationship to the Sequoias, the Andreessen's, the Benchmarks, the Coastlas, you know, the, the kind of the, the tier one investors or just any, any venture funds in the world is, uh, we try to have a pretty objective relationship only because it's the best for our companies. So they come to Demo Day, we have about 500 seats we hand select uh, for Demo Day and then they, they follow on. We don't actually technically co-invest in companies. We have a late stage vehicle now, but that's different. Let's talk about that. You just raised a $750 million dollar fund? $750 million dollars, and that's yeah, first fund. And this is basically why I see moving up the stack to be able to like really, really double down on these mature companies yeah, that are there's, scaling up. There's pros and cons. So we, before Y Combinator, we're only investing our own money, uh, partner's money basically, um, and then we raised this first $750 million traditional venture fund, you know, limited partners, et cetera. Uh, but it's very special in the sense that we're not investing in any company. We don't, we're not, the $750 million, I'm not out here to, to place that money. We're just investing in the companies we've already invested in, but we do it in a very special way. Uh, we're programmatically investing in every company we've ever invested in, all the way to when they're late stage. So if you raise a price round, so I'm getting into some shop talk here, but. We don't invest in safes or convertible debt, but when you're raising a price to equity around Y Combinator, will keep us pro rata. So we'll keep our percentage of the company. So Airbnb is a Y Combinator company. Every time it raises money, we get diluted. We're just gonna keep our own. Basically, shit. you raise the funds so you don't get diluted, so you can put exactly. your own money. Exactly, exactly. And then in late stage, when the company becomes really large, like a Stripe or a Zenefits, you know, anything above you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, we, in certain cases, will become lead investors where we'll write a $50 million check. Opportunistic you, investing. You mentioned, you mentioned Zenefits, so you triggered this question. <laughs> ah, um, shit. All of this talk about you know, the bubble bursting, all these unicorns being down, valued, down rounds all over the place. Yeah. Um, do you, does it have an effect on YC? Is that the same trend you're seeing? Okay, so if you're a founder, Macro environment doesn't matter. And that's a pretty controversial point here. But if you're starting a company today, it doesn't matter what the macro world looks like. Because by the time your small company becomes medium or large, whatever business cycle is already in and out. Airbnb, Dropbox, um, Stripe, three big companies, Twitch, uh, four big companies that are you know, Y Combinator companies that we seed funded, all started in the, in, the, in the collapse of the last, in the recession. And they're all doing great. You know, they're all billion dollar companies plus. Um, I think it's irrelevant for an early stage founder uh, of what's happening in the macro economy. Now, late stage is different. Because late stage is essentially replace public equities, and there's a lot of downward pressure on prices. And that's only good for investors. I and mean, that's good for a lot of people, but it's good for investors because you can get cheaper companies. Um, is it, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever been stressed, not even one day, that I thought, ah, oh, shit, the late stage is gonna, you know, the prices are being pushed down. We invest in businesses. I would love to buy a business and hold it forever until I die. I don't care about the late stage valuation and what the public markets think of it today. The best investing advice that I've gotten is buy and hold forever. And that's what I want to do. I want to buy, I don't want, uh, you know, somebody asked me at breakfast today, we had a small breakfast about these, um, or I should say investors and, and uh, get together meeting. And somebody said, um, oh, do you, do you, um, you know, do you want liquidity? Are you looking for exit? I don't want exits. I want you, I want to invest in a company that becomes a public company and stays there forever. Because if you look at compounding returns, the best return is gonna be 15 or 20 years down the road, not in the first four or five years. And so I don't really think about what the market is marking the company today or tomorrow, because I'm not looking for liquidity. I want ownership. Well, Y Company is definitely an amazing company, and for those who don't know, they're under 40 people. I think only 12 investment partners, so relatively small. 
So you can move big things with small teams. Yeah, uh, I think it's annoying to hire people. I mean, if anyone, if you've ever, <laughs> if you ever owned a company or if you ever ran a company, I, you know, I had a couple of companies myself before, like hiring people and managing people is just absolutely a disaster, and it's just a pain in the ass. Just and people in general. And just people in general. If I could run a, if I could run a company of one, I would absolutely do it. And it's not because I'm greedy or cheap. It's just because it's it's it takes time. You know, it takes time to manage people. And I want to do my best to make sure my, the people on my team and the people who work in YC are, they feel their career is moving. It takes a lot of personal time and personal investment. And I would rather spend all of that time with the companies. And so I get very concerned when companies want to hire a lot of people. I think people do it for ego. Um, I, think, uh, I think Buffett and some other folks have said, you know, in most large companies, you could probably fire 50% of the people and not notice the difference. I mean, it's like, you know, the old subsidy, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in the old Eastern Bloc here. The old old subsidies used to come from the central government. Now new subsidies come from large companies. Like a company like Google, I worked at Google, I love Google, and a large portion of my personal wealth is in Google. I love Google. But, you know, you could probably fire 25% of Google people and you never notice the difference. You probably fire 50% and not notice the difference. That's a controversial statement. Yeah, what, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so speaking of time, we're out of it. Um, Kassar, thank you so much for coming over. That was fast. He's going to be here in the weekend, so feel free to bother him and harass him. Yeah, the him. last point I would say is I think they have my Twitter hand. I've never tweeted, so that's uh, – I'll, I'll give you um, uh, my email address. is my first name, Q-A-S-A-R, Ycombinator.com. Um, spam him all you want. Spam me all, me all you want. I do read my emails. Uh, uh, the point I would ask you is please send me things to do in the city. I have a day and a half free. And this is my easy way to crowdsource things for me to do. Just email See, me. Now you have an opening. And, yeah, and, and uh, if you can't think of something to do in Bulgaria, email me your favorite book, and I'll respond with my favorite book. And we can start a conversation. And especially if you're founding a company, I'm happy to give you free advice. <laughs> Thank you, Kassar. Yeah.